In July 1991, 20-year-old Penny Hill was brutally bashed and left to die on the side of a country road. She had just left home only three days before to begin her dream job as a nanny when her future was stolen from her. I always hoped it would be solved, but it just didn't happen. Who killed Penny Hill? She comes home like a rose. Was it the rock star and his wife? Are you protecting your ex-husband? No, I'm not. The boyfriend? He's an obvious line of inquiry as well. Or someone else? Penny Hill's family has never given up hope, and neither have police. Today, launching a $1 million reward for information. I want to help find out who killed Penny. Her family deserves justice, and New South Wales police want justice. Detective Superintendent Deborah Wallace rose to the top of the New South Wales police force with grace, humour and an iconic sense of style. The person that was shot is known to police. In her incredible 37 years in the force... Police Wallace took on murderers, drug suppliers and bikey gangs. All cases can be solved. They're never cold. And you never give up. I'm travelling to Coola in New South Wales where Penny Hill was found brutally bashed and left for dead by the side of the road. It's a small town, five hours drive northwest of Sydney. Cooler traces its heritage to the Black Stump, a classic Australian reference to a place beyond civilization. Cooler's not big, but it's country through and through. There's two pubs, of course, and the Black Stump Motel, where I'll be staying. It just so happens Penny Hill stayed here for a couple of nights before she was brutally bashed. Hi there, how are you going? Thanks for having me, Narelle, for a few days. I'm wondering if it's possible to have the same room that Penny stayed in when she was here. Down the back, near the archway, two doors on. Thanks, I'll see you in the door. Okay, Thank I'll you. see you later. Bye. Bye. I want to immerse myself as much as possible in the world Penny lived in. She stayed in room 14. It's a very basic room. There's a double bed with a side table, a bar fridge and TV, a place to hang a few clothes, and a small bathroom off to the side. Details matter because the police could never clearly establish where Penny was bashed. Was it here, inside her motel room at the Black Stump? Or somewhere else? This is Penny as a baby with her dad, Felix. She was born in 1970, on Christmas Day. Quarter past two, she arrived. First child, pretty special. A fun-loving girl. All she ever wanted to do was mind children. Yeah. Yeah. There's five years and ten months between her and her brother. And when Andrew was born, she always said, it's mine and dad's baby, not your baby, mum. There was never any question for Penny that she was going to be a nanny. She left the family home in Narrabri for six months and trained in childcare at Tamworth TAFE. Yeah, and she wasn't home all that long when she got the job there at the Cooler Black Stump Motel.
Colin and Barbara Bajant owned the Blacksnup Motel in 1991. They needed a live-in nanny to look after their three young kids. You drove her to, to Coola? We drove it to Coola. My son came as well. So did you drop her off at the Bajant's place? Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, you... and we met them and everything. OK. Yeah. What was your impression when you first met well, them? You know, you always hope it would be all good. Penny was now on her own, a stranger in a strange town, starting her dream job. One take two. Thank you. This is a town that I know well. Alex Cullen is a journalist. He grew up on a property near Cooler. I got very invested in this story because I grew up with people like Penny. This was a young, naive, trusting girl who had the world at her feet. So she got there on the Friday, her parents dropped her off. Uh, we know that she spent some time with the kids on the Saturday. And on the Sunday, she was given time to unpack. It had a bit of spare time, so we know that she went to the local pub just up the road, drank lemon squash, played some darts, hung out with a few of the locals. Penny left the pub for the short walk back to the Blackstump Motel at about 5.30 p.m. She was staying in room 14, which had been allocated to her by her employers, Colin and Barbara Bajant. After dinner, Penny took a phone call from her mother. The call came through the motel reception. You spoke for about half an hour? About a half an hour, roughly. Do you remember that, what you spoke about in that half oh, an hour? Oh, we just talked about what she'd been doing. So then you just signed off that night like yeah, normal? Yeah, yeah. There was no indication she was thinking about what she was going to do that night or anything? No, because it was so cold. She wouldn't have gone out. Penny received another phone call at about 8.30 p.m. That phone call was from her boyfriend at the time, Shane Williams. This is a 1991 photo of Penny and her boyfriend, Shane Williams. They'd only been dating for three weeks when Penny accepted the job in Coola. Alex Cullen interviewed Shane in 2015. In that call, we know she told him that she'd been hanging around at the pub, hanging around with people. I said, Shane, were you jealous? Were you worried that she was, you know, getting on a bit too well with, with other men in the town? And he denied that. He said, no, uh, no, there was nothing I could do about it. We know that after the phone call, she went back to her room, room 14. We have no idea what happened in those hours. I'm up early. It's 7.30 a.m and I'm leaving town on the same road taken by a school teacher, Susie Brown, on the morning of July 8, 1991. To exit Coola, Susie drove past the caravan park, which is just 100 metres from the Black Stump, then a further 250 metres to a bridge across the Coola Baragundi River. And a few hundred metres past the bridge, on the left-hand side of the road, Susie spotted someone lying by a gatepost. This is where Penny Hill was found, barely alive, on that cold winter's morning in 1991. Thanks for taking my call. I'm talking to Susie Brown, 
the school teacher who found Penny. What could you see from the car, Susie? Well, I could see this girl lying there and I, I thought, she's hurt. Something's happened. I called on the UHF and said that there's somebody really badly hurt, could they get the doctor and the ambulance? So then I went straight over to her. And what do you remember of her injuries? Her face was very swollen. She'd been bleeding from the nose and the ears. There was a lot of dried blood on her face, but it was smeared. She was very badly hurt and it was really hard to tell what had happened to her, but I her breathing was so laboured and I thought, she's going to die. She's going to die here. It was just heart-wrenching. Awful. I can't tell you how traumatic it was. There's more to say about what Susie saw on that day. But when the ambulance arrived, Penny was quickly taken from the scene. Doctors tried to stabilise her at Kula Hospital before she was airlifted to Newcastle's John Hunter Hospital. When we saw her, John Hunter, it, it sort of hit me how bad it was. It was a shock. Did you feel at that stage that she's going to get over this, she's going to come through? No. No. So you knew in your heart of hearts? Yep. She never regained consciousness at all. And I believe she was there 13 days before she passed yes. away. Yes. She died of um, septicemia. As a result of the injuries? Yes. Yes. So now we've gone from an assault yep. into a murder inquiry. True. Straight away. Yep. In 1991, Coola was a quiet rural backwater. Murder and violence was not part of the landscape. This was a town where the only crime recorded was a car theft, way back in the 1970s. So when news broke that Penny had died of her injuries, the community of Coola went into shock. Nobody will be able to sleep in this town till mm. the person or persons are caught. I'm sitting down with retired homicide detective Graham Merkel. He drove straight out to Coola to take over the investigation when he was informed that Penny had died. But that was a fortnight after she'd been brutally bashed. The assault wasn't taken as seriously as it should have been at the time by the, by the responding police. Was that a difficulty for you to overcome? Well, it was, it was extremely difficult because uh, uh, her room, room 14, had been cleaned. Because Penny's case began as an assault, the room had not been preserved as a crime scene. So, by the time Graham arrived at the Black Stump, Penny's room had been thoroughly cleaned. Forensic already done their stuff there, so yeah. uh, we, we had to rely on that. Forensics had documented the room by taking a series of photographs. This is the most interesting one. The remnants of a letter written by Penny to her boyfriend Shane. Remember, they'd only been dating for three weeks. The contents of that letter will never be known because that letter was discarded. That's right. The letter was torn up, thrown in the bin and sent out with the rubbish. The next step for Detective Sergeant Merkel and his team was to start interviewing people from the motel. One of the first people he spoke to was Colin Bajant, the owner of the Black Stump in 1991. Young, um, fresh girl, innocent, I think very innocent for her age. Uh, she wasn't worldly. The last sighting of Penny was at the motel late in the evening of Sunday, July 7. 
you recall where he said he was on the night that she was assaulted? Yes, he went, uh, he went fox shooting with the cook from the motel, a man named Bob Lee. Do they say what time they returned or what their movements were that night? They returned about 10.30, so they say, but they were, they were fairly vague in, the, in that time themselves. Mm. Both of them? Both of them, yeah. Yeah. The time of Penny's assault is a crucial part of this investigation, and here's why. What could you see from the car, Susie? I'm going back to my interview with Susie Brown, the school teacher who found Penny by the side of the road on the morning of July 8. There were no tracks in the dew. There'd been quite a heavy dew there, and there were no fresh tracks in the dew at all. So when does the dew start to form here in winter? Probably two or three o'clock in the morning. And I think she'd been there all night because when the ambulance driver lifted her and put her on the gurney, Underneath Penny was dry. There was an indent where a bottom had been, but the grass was dry. All of which points to the fact Penny was dumped here by her attacker or attackers sometime before the dew formed in the early hours of the morning. She had definitely been placed there. Her boots were clean. Her ugly boots were clean. So who else was at the Black Stump Motel on the night of July 7, besides Penny? The Bajans were there, and so was Bob Lee, the motel cook. Let's take a moment to focus on him. Bob Lee was a bit of a scallywag. He'd been around the traps a bit. He'd been in a bit of trouble for police over the years. In fact, Bob Lee was once a policeman. His first wife, who he divorced in the early 60s, confirmed to us that he was in the force when they were married. But when Detective Merkel caught up with Lee, the cook revealed nothing of his past life. He was just a matter of fact, you know, you're the cops, you know, this is, I don't know anything. Now, Bob Lee lived in a caravan park just 100 metres from the Black Stump Motel. An inquest into Penny Hill's murder heard from a witness who reported seeing Lee exit his Land Rover and enter his caravan in the early hours of Monday morning, July 8. Police questioned Lee several times regarding Penny's murder, later realising that he was wanted in connection with the attempted armed robbery of a brothel in the Sydney suburb of Fairfield. When they arrested him for the armed robbery, they found an arsenal of illegal weapons in his caravan, including a rifle and a silencer. Lee was released on bail. But just a few months later, he died in mysterious circumstances. Bob was involved in a car accident. Some would argue that he ended his own life out of remorse, out of guilt. The town of Kula was a hotbed of rumours. And when it came to suspects in Penny's murder, there were literally hundreds of them. You had Kula, this small town, was absolutely heaving that weekend. You had a couple of rugby league games. You had a tennis tournament. You had a golf tournament. So you had a lot of people in this mm. town, a lot of suspects, a lot of people of interest. Ross Kitto, a pro golfer from New Zealand, attracted police attention for his part in a violent altercation with his girlfriend at the Black Stump Motel. This occurred at around 9.30pm 
on July 7. The same night, Penny was bashed. It was extremely violent. Uh, she later said that she thought he was going to end her life. He apparently had his hands around her neck. The assault happened inside the couple's motel room. But here's where it gets interesting, because Ross Kitto was physically pulled off his girlfriend by none other than Colin Bajant and Bob Lee, which means they must have returned from their hunting trip before 9.30 when Kitto attacked his girlfriend. Kitto's movements for the next few hours were hard to verify because his girlfriend moved to another room at the motel. Kiddo went back to New Zealand. Uh, he has been cooperative with police, yep. with New South Wales police. That's important to note. Yep. Detective Merck Hill soon became much more interested in the owners of the Black Stump Motel, Colin and Barbara Bajant. When I interviewed the Bajants, I found them fairly elusive, both of them, both Barbara and Colin Bajant. Their stories changed just even during the time I was interviewing them. I do have my, my suspicions that for the Bajants know far more than what they're saying. I grew up in Sydney's Parramatta in the 1970s. It goes without saying that I love my Aussie rock bands. I'm a huge fan of Cold Chisel, ACDC and The Oils. And who could forget Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs? She comes home like a rose. This is Billy knows. Thorpe and the Aztecs on Channel 9's bandstand in 1966 with their smash hit Poison Ivy. Who's on drums? A very young Colin Bajan. Bajan moved on from the Aztecs in the 60s, and by the early 1980s, he and his third wife were looking for a tree change. And they moved to Kulara to manage the Black Stump Motel. But when police started investigating Penny Hill's murder in 1991, the Bajans were vague and unhelpful. I was never happy with my interviews of them. You'd speak to them and they'd say, oh, I did this at such and such a time, I did that. Then you sit down behind the typewriter, take a statement off it, and they'd say something else. Now, we know that Colin was violent in his relationships, in his past relationships. He was alleged to have been violent in his relationship with Barbara and before that as well. Uh, did that come up in one of the inquests? It did, exactly right. The inquest heard Mr Bajant had been violent to three of his wives. Barbara Bajant blamed herself, saying, he didn't just hit me for no reason. The coroner replied, he shouldn't have hit you at all. In the second inquest, it was also alleged Colin Bajant had a history of abusing and acting inappropriately towards his employees. Hi, Tracy. I'm on the phone to Tracy. She doesn't want to give her last name, which I respect. Tracy had a harrowing experience when she was working at the Black Stump Motel in 1991. I was only 16 at the time when I was working for Cole. Tracy was hired by Colin Bajant a few weeks before Penny Hill was hired as a nanny. And that's when he sacked me before she started. And why did he sack you? Because I didn't give what he wanted. Colin Bajant employed Tracy to work in the laundry. And what kind of work did you do in the laundry? I was doing sheets, towels, you name it. I'm standing outside the laundry right now and I wondered if you could tell me what happened that night Cole Bajant came to see you in there. Well, I was just finished washing the blankets and then I seen he come down with two glasses of wine. He'd 
touched me on the breast and down below. He came down with trying to get me drunk so he can rape me, and that's why I never went back. I'm so sorry this happened to you, Tracy. Did you have a sense before that night that there just wasn't something quite right with Cole Badgent? I thought there was something wrong when I first met him. Tracy didn't take her allegations to the police, but she did tell her story to the coroner looking into Penny Hill's murder. Colin Bajan denied her allegations and was never charged. Let's go back to the Blackstump Motel on the night of July 7, 1991. We now know that Colin Bajan and Bob Lee were back from their hunting trip by 9.30pm in time to stop the Ross Kitto assault on his girlfriend. But what about after that? Colin's wife, Barbara, told police that her husband locked up the motel and was with her for the rest of the night. Thanks for taking my call tonight. I'm on the phone to Stephen Davis, who lived right next door to the Bajans in 1991. On the night Penny was bashed, he was lying in bed when he heard a strange sound. Can you tell me what actually happened on that night? It was approximately 1.30 in the morning. I heard a noise. It sounded like a sliding door on a van, just closing very quietly. And I heard the car idle away, and it idled away without sort of revving the motor, changing up through the gears. So I thought that was a bit odd. Do you know if Cole Badgent actually had a van at the time? I believe he did. Stephen was unable to tell what make and model the van was from the idling noise. Only that it was a van. Penny lay in a coma in Newcastle's John Hunter Hospital for 13 days before she succumbed to her injuries. Her parents, Jeanette and Felix, kept a vigil by her bedside all that time. But if they wanted to be left in peace, they weren't getting any. They kept receiving phone calls from a particular person in Kula. Three and four times a day for the first week, asking had she regained consciousness. And who was asking that? From the motel. Colin or Barbara? It was him that rang. So yeah. Colt Badgett would ring you to see has she regained consciousness? Yeah. To me, I thought was a bit strange. Yeah. Were they frightened she was going to say what happened? Strange question to ask when you're yeah. just checking on welfare generally. That's right. And you don't forget those sort of things. No. Following Penny's death, Colin Bajan became the prime suspect in the murder investigation. His wife, Barbara, was also a person of interest. After agreeing to one sit-down interview protesting his innocence, Colin Bajan had very little to say for the next 30 years. In 2012, a second coronial inquest was held into the murder of Penny Hill. Important new evidence was presented regarding DNA profiles for the key persons of interest. DNA samples from Colin Bajant and golfer Ross Kiddo have been taken. Police are also sourcing samples from the family of Bob Lee, the motel cook, who died just months after Penny was found. In the second inquest, Barbara Bajant faced intense questioning over Colin's movements on the night Penny was bashed. Back in 1991, 
She told police that her husband was with her the entire night. In the inquest, the second inquest, Barbara changed her story. Mrs Bajent couldn't be certain Colin Bajent hadn't left their bed during the night, but said, if I had any knowledge of what happened to Penny, I would have said so. Are you protecting your ex-husband? No, I'm not. What? Did he have anything to do with uh, what happened to Penny Hill? No, he didn't. Sadly, when it comes to violence towards women, the facts don't lie. On average, one woman a week is murdered by her current or former partner. So when police were investigating who may have been responsible for the murder of Penny Hill, one person they looked at was her boyfriend, Shane Williams. On the night she was bashed and left to die, Sunday, July 7, 1991, Penny Hill took a phone call from Shane Williams at about 8.30 or 9 p.m. She was at the Blackstump Motel in Coola. He was in Armidale, where he lived. But apart from the phone call, what else was Shane Williams doing on the night of July 7? Where did you say he was? I think he'd been to uh, some event with the Salvation Army and then he'd gone home to his family and went to bed. He was there next morning. I didn't find anything suspicious about him at all and basically eliminated him from my inquiries. Williams remained off the police radar until the second inquest in 2012, when he found it difficult to recall the exact details of his movements on the night Penny was attacked. Alex Cullen questioned him further in an interview in 2015. He says that he was in Armidale that night. And I said to him, well, what were you doing in Armidale that night? And he couldn't really tell me. He, he said, oh, look, I could have been doing any, any one of things. I could have been at church. I could have been walking around on a property that I had access to at the time. Uh, I could have been at home with my parents, which struck me as quite odd. Yeah. I thought, well, hang on, this is the night that you're girlfriend was bashed within yeah. an inch of her life and, and you don't remember where exactly you were. Shane doesn't really have a good memory of where he actually was the night of Penny's assault. But if it was your girlfriend, how would you forget something that horrific in your lifetime? And that gives you rise to some questions in your mind. That's perhaps. exactly right. If he talked to on that night and then he can't recall where he was, well, it's a little bit hard to believe. I don't forget things. I can remember things from when I was little. Following his memory loss at the 2012 inquest, police began taking a closer look at Shane Williams as a person of interest in Penny Hill's murder. Danny, could you tell us who you are and what you do? Uh, Detective Superintendent Danny Doherty. I'm the commander of the State Crime Command Homicide Squad. Danny Doherty is in charge of the reinvestigation into Penny Hill's murder and he's got some questions for Shane Williams. Being uh, in a short relationship and being so obviously besotted with Penny uh, it does raise a, a few flags and uh, he's an obvious line of inquiry as well. So, Williams called Penny from Armidale on the night she was attacked. We know she told him where she was staying and her room number. But could he have jumped in his car after the call, driven to Kula? and then back to Armidale before sunrise. It's a 300 kilometre drive each way. He's some distance away, you know, 300 kilometres. That doesn't necessarily, in your mind, discount that he could have made the trip? Well, it doesn't discount it. 
Um, again, you have to have an open mind about these things. Plenty of things have happened and we definitely can't discount that, that theory. Police are now re-examining all of William's statements. So there's some discrepancies in, in his versions, which creates an opportunity for us to have a look at. There was some mention of uh, some involvement with um, and links with the Salvation Army we would, we would make further inquiries with and also um, his access to um, vehicles and what type of vehicles he may have had access to at the time. In July 1991, Williams was driving a blue Datsun Stanza. Around 11.40pm on July 7, Barbara Bajard reported seeing a dark-coloured car, similar to a Commodore, driving through the Black Stump Motel car park without the lights on. Shane owned a blue Datsun Stanza. Mm. And police believe that she may have mistaken that Stanza for a Commodore. Yeah. So they looked at that very, very closely. New clues have emerged about the murder 22 years ago of 20-year-old Penny Hill at Cooler in the state's west. A car found near the murder scene, which was originally described as a Commodore, is now believed to have been a blue Datsun Stanza. A police forensics team in Sydney searched William's old stanza in 2013, looking for clues to Penny's murder. I asked him straight out, did you kill Penny Hill? No, of course not. I would not hurt her in any way possible. What do you think happened to Penny? I believe that one of the people that we've mentioned has had a sexual interest in her. It's time to reach out to my good friend, retired Detective Chief Inspector Wayne Hayes, for a second opinion in the murder of Penny Hill. I call Wayne the Homicide Whisperer. We've given you access to the research files. Is there anything that you can share with me that struck you from those files? Quite a bit, actually. It's just amazing that somebody that's there in three days, they're murdered. There are some complications. There's a golf tournament and there's a rugby league competition in town that day, so there are a lot of people in the town. But Wayne's primary focus is room 14 at the Black Stump Motel. That's where he believes Penny was assaulted. Somebody gains access to that motel room. They've either got to be known to get that, they've got to have a key to get that, it's a motel. They knock on the door and she opens it, which she probably would, if it's a, what I term a blitz attack by somebody. So you do have enormous potential for a crime scene there. When she's found the next morning and inquiries commence, the room itself is basically undisturbed. Mm. We've spoken to Graham Merkel, the original investigating officer. He would have found some difficulties taking over that case, no doubt. Well, what have you got? They've left you with nothing. Unfortunately, the letter that Penny wrote to her boyfriend was thrown out in the garbage. The envelope is all that's left. So I want to ask Wayne about Shane Williams as a murder suspect. You've got this torn up letter. You've got an envelope there addressed to him. What does it say? Was it a go away letter? Was I've met somebody else's letter? Well, you don't know. And there's a telephone conversation with them. In his favour, he's at Armadale. So he's got to drive at night, um, 600 kilometres round trip. Let's make it a six hour drive. It's possible, but it's a big drive. 
Williams cannot account for his movements in Armidale on the night Penny was bashed. That doesn't look good for him. Neither does Barbara Bajan's witness statement that she saw a car similar to Williams in the motel car park on the night of July 7. But is Barbara Bajan a reliable witness? Or her husband, Colin? Or the motel cook, Bob Lee? Wayne believes the answer lies at the Black Stump Motel. Putting it all together, my view is I'm looking at somebody that's associated with the motel. And that's it, finish end. The first person on the motel suspect list is the Black Stump's cook, Bob Lee. A former policeman, Lee was on the run for an armed robbery when Penny was fatally bashed at the motel. But he dies in a road accident yep. shortly afterwards. The rumour mill goes overboard, the town saying he's clearly done it. Because he's committed suicide. A, the investigating police don't think so. And B is people kill themselves in road accidents all the yeah. time. People are killed, people survive. It's, yeah. it's luck of the draw sometimes, I'm afraid. She comes home like a rose. What view do you form of the bosses of Penny, the Bajans? Husband and wife, three very young children. They need a nanny. She applies and is selected. She comes and after one shift, basically is nah, not suitable. Now, this is something I haven't revealed before. When Penny's mother, Jeanette, rang the black stump to speak to Penny on the night of July 7, it was Barbara Bajan who answered the phone. Barbara told Jeanette that Penny wasn't working out as their nanny and she was going to sack her. She just said that she might have been a bit young. And I thought, well, how can you decide on somebody for such a short time? Yeah. Because she'd only worked one day and they gave her the next day off. And here's something else. Penny stayed with the Bajans in their family home on the night she arrived, July 5th. But then the Bajans shifted her into room 14 the very next day. Moving out of the family home into this hotel room, being terminated, it's, something's happened there, I, th I, I, I think. I'm interested in Wayne's take on the movements of Colin Bajant and Bob Lee on the night that Penny was attacked. They were both at the motel at around 9.30pm when they separated Ross Kito from his girlfriend. Two people are very proximate yeah. to the deceased. Two people potentially, because they're known to her, have access to the room. What do you think happened to Penny? I believe that one of the people that we've mentioned has had a sexual interest in her and has gone and knocked on the door, which has been opened or has gained access somehow. Maybe she says something that makes that person enraged. And once you're enraged, it just got out of control. Yeah. You just don't know whether or not alcohol or drugs played a part in it as well, because that loosens people's restraint. They behave less responsibly than what they do when they're not affected by drugs or alcohol. And then she's only taken 800 metres down the road. Why would you take somebody 800 metres down the road? Because you've got to be home quickly, because you can't be away for very long. You can't go very far because you could be discovered. Remember a witness reported seeing Bob Lee exiting his car and entering his caravan in the early hours of Monday, July 8. Is it possible that with his police training, Bob Lee could have forensically cleaned room 14 in the early hours of July 8, after assaulting Penny in her room? That would explain why police found nothing untoward the next day and were happy to release room 14 back to the motel. With this case, how would you breathe life back into it? 
there will be some potential for DNA. I'd be looking at DNA again. This is the jumper that Penny was wearing the night she was attacked and left for dead. Police have retained it as an exhibit in the hope they can match DNA on the jumper to Penny's killer or killers. With the advent in DNA technology, they hold potential to possibly identify who carried the deceased. If my DNA is on their clothing, yeah. I've got to explain why. Over the years, I've become an advocate of the Homicide Victim Support Group, founded in 1993 by the parents of Anita Cobby and Ebony Simpson. The group supports families and friends affected by the death of a loved one to homicide. The pain for these families never goes away, as Penny Hill's father, Felix, knew all too well. He was traumatised by his daughter's murder until the day he died. He took it very hard. She was dad's girl and he never got over losing her. It would have been nice if he'd have known before he went. I always hoped it would be solved quickly, but it just didn't happen. And here we are, 30, you know, 30 years, years later, still talking and looking for answers, aren't we? That's right. Penny Hill's family has never given up hope that her killer would be caught, and neither have police, who today offered a substantial reward for anyone who can help them crack the case. You're always hopeful. You never give up hope. And neither have detectives, today launching a $1 million reward for information really only means something if we get information from the from the community and from the public someone would know what's happened the original investigation is reviewed the two coronial inquests are reviewed all contemporary information that we have is reviewed is there any forensic evidence that we may be able to re-examine the advances in dna and forensic science is significant and also of technology The jumper Penny was wearing when she was dumped by the road may yet provide a link to her killer. Police have obtained DNA samples from Shane Williams, Colin Bajant and Ross Kitto. Police have not yet revealed if they have conducted DNA analysis using samples from the family of Bob Lee, the motel cook. Do you have a feeling what happened to Penny that night? It changes daily, Deb. In the lead up to my chat with you here today, I, I've, I've delved right back into it and I thought to myself, Shane Williams, the boyfriend. Could he have driven that far that night? Mm. Could he have done it without fueling up? Nobody will be able to sleep in this town till mm. the person or persons are caught. And then I think of Cole Bajant. Could he have done it? A lot of things don't stack up. For a long time, I was convinced of one thing. And then today, I'm convinced of the other, which makes it so hard for these investigators. What I realised from my time in Kula is that it's a very short distance from the Black Stump Motel to where Penny was dumped. I wonder by leaving her in plain sight of passing motorists, whoever assaulted Penny didn't really want to kill her. Maybe they wanted her to be found alive. Even if that's the case, it doesn't answer the question. 
Was she killed by her boyfriend or someone associated with the motel? It's not knowing, it's the unknown that you always think about. You think, how could someone do this and walk away and leave a person? How can they carry on with life and have no guilt about what they've done? Why should they walk scot-free? She gets a death sentence, we get the life sentence. 